Hey all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I am Austin, also known as Teacup. I'm one of your hosts for this podcast. I'm here with my other host. I'm Shelby or Sheikup. Super excited to be here today. Yeah. So today we have special guests with us. We have B and Vega from the Win in Fadis podcast to join us today. Hello. 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 Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah. yes, I'm so excited. And so we are talking about a character deep dive today. We have continued in our season three. We've been talking about magic and spirits and all kinds of things. So all of our character deep dives this season have been mages and or spirits. Mm. We did Cole, so he can, he's not really a mage. <laughs> but But tonight, tonight we are talking about the Ice Queen herself, first enchanter. Vivian. Yes. There's so much love for her. Vivian is such an interesting character and a very controversial and hotly debated character mm-hmm. in the fandom, which I kind of hate to be honest that mm-hmm. Bioware, I, fe- I feel like both, and I kind of lump Vivian and Jacob Taylor for Mass Effect into the same category mm-hmm. of where they wrote Black companions. And they're both yes. either super controversial or like Jacob is so bland and boring. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it is really unfair, I feel. Um, and so I hate that. I hate that she's so controversial in the fandom. But hopefully tonight, for those of y'all listening, you will see a side of Vivian that you may not have ever seen before, especially for those of you that are super gung-ho pro-mage, pro-elf, I encourage you to have an open mind while you listen to this episode um, because there's a lot about Vivian that is not apparent Mm -hmm. um, if you just interact with her like on the surface level um, in the times that you have to interact with her. So I think that those of you who don't like Vivian right now, you may have a slightly different opinion, I hope, after this episode. So I just encourage you to keep an open mind. So... We are back with our fun facts. We haven't been doing fun facts during our Spirits and Demons series because it's not any. So we're back (laughs) with fun facts. Um, But Vivian is a companion in Inquisition, as most of us know. In case you don't know, she was, before becoming a companion, a first enchanter in the Montsimard circle, not in Valrio, um, but still in Orlais, and she was the personal advisor and enchanter to Empress Selene. So this means that she's super, super well-traveled, and she's got connections in a lot of different places in Thetis, which I feel like makes total sense. Um, And she has experience and roots to specifically at least three different countries in Thetis. Mm -hmm. Her parents were originally from Ravane, and they were merchants. Vivian, however, was born in Wycom in the Free Marches, which meant that she went to the Ostwick circle when her magic manifested. And if you play a mage in Inquisition, you also are from the Ostwick circle. So you automatically have that in common with her. And then when she was 19, she transferred to the circle in Orlais. So um, when she became a full enchanter, which after she passes her harrowing and all that, she did not join one of the mage fraternities, which almost never happens, was super, super unheard of. And everyone was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is an option kind of thing. So already we know that she is a person who is not afraid to stand out from the crowd and be different. Also, this is another thing that was shocking to me is the ne- this next fun fact. And this is that DeFair, we often hear her referred to as Vivian DeFair, that is not her last name. It is a nickname that was given to her. And the full nickname is actually Madame DeFair, which translated means the Lady of Iron. 
According to the Dragon Age Wikipedia page, uh, this indicates that she was both a respected and feared member of the Orlesian court. I don't know if I would go so far as to say that that's like, they're almost painting it as a compliment. I'm not sure I would go that far because to me, it's very Orlesian though, isn't it? Yeah. That's true. That's true. But to me, it very much evokes the like Margaret Thatcher imagery, um, Mm -hmm. the English prime minister. And I mean, I don't think that's a fair (laughs) comparison to her at all. Um, Yeah. So I would be offended personally, but that's just me. That's like very classic Orle to give you like a name that it sounds like a compliment. And then when you walk away later, you're like, "Mm? like, wait, what did they say? Yeah. They call me a what? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. like, wait a minute that was backhanded hold up wait a exactly. minute exactly didn't they actually call margaret thatcher the iron lady they did they yeah. did yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's real that like that's not a headcan <laughs> <laughs> well damn so vivian is easily hands down the most well-dressed character in all of dragon age like <laughs> no, absolutely. not even a competition at all um but she was also well-dressed like of Thetis opinions um and so they dubbed her the jewel of the high court of Orle because she had such good taste in fashion I do feel like that is actually a compliment which is good I love that for her Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and then also with her fashion she very much was inspired by the character of Maleficent for her fashion specifically Mm Um, and her name is kind of taken from the fashion designer Vivian Westwood. So she's got a lot of fashion iconography mm-hmm. going on there. I have one thought. Vivian 100% would swear eternal vengeance for not being <laughs> invited to a party. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. Totally. It makes you wonder what they had in mind when they were like, this one's going to look like Maleficent. Definitely like bad bitch material, but still an antagonist. And it mm-hmm. seems like that's kind of the nature of where she gets set up sometimes mm-hmm. and it, especially with um her personal quest which is like literally like bring me the heart like they literally titled it bring me the heart mm-hmm. of snow white evil queen um, and yeah and it's like oh can you go get me the heart of a snowy white wyvern so they had a lot um, of stuff in mind yeah they were playing with that idea yeah That's a really great point. So if she is your friend, um, she offers to take you to meet her seamstress. Um, And if she's not your friend, she then rearranges all the furniture in Skyhold, which I think is hilarious. Like, what a power move. Um, She's really petty and I love that for her. Yes. Yeah, we. I feel like we don't get a lot of characters who are petty in Dragon Age. mm -hmm. Like, Mm mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, I guess it's hard like we, to write. I don't know. Like, we get spiteful, but not, mm-hmm. like, petty. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, someone will get, like, angry or, like, have resentment, but not the pettiness of, like, sitting there in your face being like, yes, I told them to put the dresser over there, and I told them to put that over there. Whatever are you talking about? Because that, And that's not our legion shit. Yeah. That, like, <laughs> high society, I can't just, like, punch you in the street, so mm-hmm. this is what I'm going to do instead. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and then my last fun fact is that her greatest fear is irrelevance, which I completely mm-hmm. understand that 100%. Yeah. And I think, I think her keeping herself relevant has kept her protected in a way. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, mm-hmm. as we'll, as we'll see when, um, you go through like her bio and whatnot, um, it seems like her proving herself has like secured safety um and like if you're not relevant you don't have protection you're not Mm. showing a value to other people so uh you know understandable have a nice day (laughs) baby yeah that I totally get that too so let's move on to her just like general bio and the accomplishments that she has achieved Mm. which this is pretty extensive usually like Mm -hmm. I, I could have split this up into like her bio and her accomplishments separately, but I just kind of left it together Mm. because that's what we usually do. Um, But Vivian is super accomplished. She is one of the youngest fully fledged mages in the history of the circle. 
And according to the codex entry on Vivian, she was voted in as the first enchanter of the Montsimard circle at an age young enough to cause significant scandal. So not only is she one of the youngest mages to pass their harrowing, she's also one of the youngest mages, if not the youngest mage ever, Mm -hmm. to become a first enchanter. I wrote in the show notes, very, (laughs) we will watch your career with great interest, Palpatine quote. Um, But seriously, like, she's very accomplished. And I mean, I think this shows like just how talented she is at magic and i think that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that means we should listen to her opinions because she Mm -hmm. is so talented yeah so i recently took vivian into the fade in here Mm -hmm. lies the abyss and just you really see this when you take her into the fade when she's saying everything Mm -hmm. because obviously solace is being soulless and (laughs) mysterious and not answering anything because he's Mm -hmm. soulless Mm -hmm. And, and dorian is very much in a line of like this could be happening or this could be happening (laughs) vivian is like this is how it is this is what's happening you should listen to me because i'm the boss bitch (laughs) (laughs) i love that though i don't think i've ever taken her so i love that 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 how she speaks with such um what's the word i'm looking for conviction maybe like she's Mm -hmm. like okay stop guessing we're not theorizing this is what it is let's go let's go let's get it Yeah, she always speaks with like gravitas. Like she's never unsure of her words ever. Mm-hmm. ever. There's no confusion. And I think there's an understanding that Vivian understands her words have power. And so there's mm-hmm. intentionality mm-hmm. in there. She never, she plays the game of Orlay, mm-hmm. but she doesn't really like do this thing where she's saying one thing and meaning another. She's yes. very flat of what she mm-hmm. thinks and what mm-hmm. she thinks of people and the Inquisition. True. Very true. Oh, that's a fantastic point. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about her relationship with the Duke really quickly. Um, because I thought this was interesting and more like there's more to it than I thought about um, when I was doing the research. So mm-hmm. in 916 Dragon at the Imperial Winter's End Ball, Mages from the circle um, in Montsimard and the White Spire were both invited to attend festivities and entertain the court. Vivian, of course, was among this group. This is when she meets Duke Bastien, Dickies Lane, and they spend all evening together dancing only with each other, which frankly pisses off a bunch of the nobles. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it just, you know, how they are in Orle. Um, and then Bastien visits her in Montsamard, like not even a week later. And he is accompanied by a quote, small army of florists that have armloads <laughs> of peonies. And so basically he then invites Vivian to a bunch of parties that are held at his estate. And by the start of summer, she has a whole suite of rooms in his house um, from which she Hmm. basically does all of her business. So this, obviously, as you can imagine, creates a pretty huge scandal in Orle Mm -hmm. um, because Mm -hmm. she's a mage and he is a member of the Council of Heralds. And if you're listening and you're not sure what the Council of Heralds is, We have talked about them in our season two briefly, and they are an Orlesian group and they're, they're basically their sole job is concerned with issues of nobility and lineage, specifically um, what happens, like who comes next in the line of emperor and empress. So they're the ones that chose Celine to rule over, um, over Gaspard. So that's his job. And this causes a huge scandal. A lot of bards actually were sent to eliminate her, quote from the wiki again. Um, Mm -hmm. Half of them were returned to their employers frozen solid, while the other half of them were then convinced (laughs) to work for Vivian, which again, like that is amazing. Yeah. Um, like nobody's doing it like she's doing it really no, nobody nobody and Lord. she she does continue to like endure this hostility from the nobility um and even outright they're working against her to bring her down um until she becomes celine's court enchanter and mm. we'll talk about this i think in a minute but 
she's the first one to put power behind this position too, which is also significant. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like we talked about earlier during her personal quest, Vivian Mm -hmm. asks the Inquisitor to bring her the heart of a snowy wyvern. And then should you do this for her, she uses it to create a potion for Bastien, who is supposedly suffering from an incurable disease, um, but the potion doesn't work and he dies in Inquisition. So what do we think about their relationship? Austin, you have your hand raised, so. Well, I just think it's interesting. This is now the third classic fairy tale we've alluded to. Mm -hmm. She's styled after Maleficent. Mm -hmm. Um, There's the snowy, bring me the heart of Snow White. And now we have Cinderella in this thing of like someone coming into the ball and stealing the heart of this important person. Oh, nice. Oh, that's good. That's 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 some real like literary analysis. (laughs) Let's go. Thanks. I have a master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good point. I think for me, I was always, or not always, but a little bit skeptical of their relationship. Like I picture at least an age difference between them. I don't know if that's accurate, mm-hmm. but that's how I picture it. Um, and so mm-hmm. I always felt a little bit off about their relationship just because mm-hmm. we didn't know very much. She's kind of secretive about it. You know, Mm -hmm. there's this power differential too. And like, what is the deal there? Um, But Mm -hmm. I feel like this story is very romantic. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of their history shows that they really do love each other. um, Mm -hmm. And despite the the odds of them being able to work out as a couple. And the thing that I um, I usually think about with it is we don't know how old Vivian is. And they did meet when she was young. Bestien does look very old and I consider I mean maybe he was younger she says that he was dashing he was a dashing rogue right he didn't look very dashing but the man was on his deathbed so I will give him you know (laughs) some grace but I can assume that he might have been younger too when they met and there might have been some like common ground there but Mm -hmm. I also do think she is very like upfront about the nature of their relationship and Mm -hmm. The questions that you can ask about it feel almost as if they're for you, the player character, who may not have experiences with like, it doesn't even have to be like an example of a polyamorous relationship. It is, Mm -hmm. but that's very common in court because you can do that in Origins. You can Mm -hmm. marry Alistair and keep Zevran as the queen's consort. So that's very typical in court because marriages is just the stuff of alliances, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that question asking her about that is more for you, the player in this world because you've never been in court intrigue most likely Mm -hmm. and not so much from the inquisitor not understanding that but i like her approach to responding to it she's like oh well she's she's fine but we (laughs) did have to bury her a few years ago you know she's like that poor dear like she obviously has a good relationship with his Mm -hmm. wife she's Mm -hmm. close to his kids and his sister Mm -hmm. and i think it's a very it is a nice very healthy example of whatever the closest connection to it could be mm-hmm. for you and it is very romantic it is very cinderella and i just love the idea of a very wealthy person expending that wealth upon me like <laughs> you're gonna bring me all of these flowers like i mean if you're gonna spend it on somebody that's a very nice way to use that instead of using it above me you're mm-hmm. kind of using it for me like and that. that might kind of bridge that power Mm-hmm. imbalance that could exist from him being a duke and her being like a young new you know um she was younger and new to the i don't remember if he said it, she was new to the circle but it was it seemed like they were there kind of almost like on a field trip like mm-hmm. you get to go see the court <laughs> yeah. today so, so it definitely could have occurred so this is really interesting because i just while you are talking i was doing the math for vivian's mm-hmm tried to calculate like mm-hmm. roughly when Vivian was born. So at 19, she's transferred to from Ostwick to Montsimard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 916, if we assume that she's 19 there, the lowest mm-hmm. possible age she could be there, that mm-hmm. would put her born in like 897 blessed, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm. So she is one of only second companions, I believe, to be born in the blessed age. Ooh. So she is older now. I always, I don't know why I always assumed that she was older. Maybe mm-hmm. it's because that, again, the way that she talks, it doesn't seem like it's just book intelligence she's lived. Yeah. So she would be 
she would be around the same age as the hero of Ferelden, roughly, like most of the party members. No, she'd be about 10 years older because it's like 930. Okay. 930 Dragon is the fifth blight. Oh, okay. So okay. she's yeah, almost like mm-hmm. between Wynn's age and the hero of Ferelden's age. Correct. Mm-hmm. I love that for her. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I like that. I kind of like that. <laughs> Thank like you for that. doing the math. Like- yeah thank you thank you and it's like it's very nice because i feel like you know especially in um fantasy settings and whatnot you don't get a lot of party members that are in that like middle age group it's like you either Mm -hmm. have the really old wise person or you have like the young sporty adventurer so the teenager it's it's nice Yeah, yeah yeah so it's like nice to have you know someone in between who has some lived experience but They don't know, like, they're not super wise. They don't know, like, everything, but they've lived long enough to, like, have info in the world and and have, quote, unquote, street smarts. And just, Mm -hmm. you know, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I agree. I think we need more, like, middle-aged characters, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't help that it's sometimes hard to depict ages in video games when it comes to (laughs) Bioware. Oh, yeah. yeah we won't because... hold that against them <laughs> <laughs> or should we <laughs> i don't know but because there's only two complexions if you want to look older it's like I'm bastian me. or like nothing yeah because <laughs> yeah, it really does depict him seeming like this older man which would maybe change the way that you think about their relationship mm-hmm. because he does mm-hmm. look very old but they may be closer in age than yeah. they appear because yeah. he was sick yeah, right. yeah. she is late 40s by the events of trespasser if okay, she, okay. i'm like kind of adding in differences if we mm-hmm. assume she's 19 and 9 16 mm-hmm. that'll put her around early 40 early to mid 40s okay. by the events like of uh, inquisition and then mid to late 40s for trespasser yeah i like that Mm-hmm. so um let's talk about her being court enchanter a little bit so um <laughs> like i said a minute ago before um she held this position and i'm gonna do a little quoting here the mm-hmm. wikipedia page says that the court enchanter position was no more than a simple court jester but vivian mm. changes this position into one with significant and real power um And so then it becomes more of an advisory position to the empress and emperor, especially as an expert on all things magical. I think it's really, really problematic to have the first unambiguously Black (laughs) companion to be in a role that was a simple court jester, even if they changed it, even if they overcame that, I still think that's massively messed up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I, um, I, I agree with that. Historically, you know, you get you, you know, you finally get a black person in a role in like TV or movie for like a long time and they would be the comic relief. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that like, yeah, it's great that she turned it around. But the fact that she had to turn it around, mm-hmm. you know, it's like it, it doesn't read great. <laughs> right and like this is fantasy this is a fantasy setting like yeah. she can be anything she can be anyone it, she doesn't have to we don't have to recreate like our systems in this world mm-hmm. either um, mm-hmm. it's very frustrating yeah. so I just wanted I wanted to make sure I said that because it like really <laughs> pissed me off yeah uh, there are <laughs> things that it brings that it makes me think of but I can bring it up later but sure. just like a shorter version of that is it does get into that having to work hard for your place Mm -hmm. and that's the first example of it that we get as you look through her story yeah Mm -hmm. so when we meet vivian in the games we have basically received an invitation to her salon that is being held at uh, the duke's estate and so when we arrive the marquise alphonse openly insults the inquisitor Vivian sees this, (laughs) freezes him with winter magic, and basically leaves his fate into the Inquisitor's hand. Vivian very much sees the Inquisition as the only group that's willing to stand up to the chaos that's plaguing Thetis, which is why she wants to join. But later, banter with Cole reveals that Vivian manipulates the Marquis into verbally attacking the Inquisition at her party, which then allows her to deal with him in response to the vicious insult that he had previously dealt her. So she is 
basically demonstrating that she's a master of the game, right? And she we, knows how to I play the Orlesian game. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, I wish I had put the banter in here, but I think it was long, so I didn't. Um, it's but scary. it it was very. Um, I think it's very eye opening that like. Mm -hmm. she plays the game that well that we didn't even notice or pick up on it um yeah so I think that's significant too I mean when you think about it she had those receipts ready for him so maybe (laughs) that's because that's on account of she knew that she sent him here like all in a fucked up state so that he would embarrass himself and she's Mm -hmm. like "Mm, I know exactly what's going on with you yes yeah Yeah. exactly wow So we have demonstrated so far that Vivian is extremely talented in magic and in playing the game. She is very accomplished. She um, is well-read, well-versed in all of the things that have to deal with magic and playing the game. So I wanted that to be our base to transition into talking about her attitudes toward mages, Mm -hmm. because I know that this is the main reason why a lot of people in the fandom either view her as controversial or just don't like Mm -hmm. her. So I wanted Mm -hmm. us to have that base of like, she's accomplished. She knows what she's doing. She's not just some like random person that has internalized hatred and um, wants to spew that onto others. Like that's, that's not at all Mm -hmm. who we're dealing with. So Mm -hmm. let's get into it. Vivian is resentful of the rebel mages specifically not necessarily toward all mages as the fandom Mm -hmm. sometimes likes to believe but she is specifically upset at how the rebel mages rebelled that is her issue not that she hates magic not that she hates all mages specifically about the rebel mages and so she believes that they the rebel mages only see their own oppression and they fail to consider the um, their innate power and the safety of non-mages. She also hates violence, um, specifically the violence of the Mage Rebellion, but all violence. So I brought like a little bit of a snippet of a conversation that the Inquisitor can have with Vivian. So Vivian says, um, and it's about it's about the Mage Rebellion. So Vivian says. So long as they had their freedom, they could have cared little for riots, angry mobs, or about pitting mages against each other. The Inquisitor asks, but did they have cause to rebel? And then Vivian says, in the aftermath of a terrorist attack, was that really the most opportune time to break away? By all means, protest abuses by the Templars. Just don't do it in a way that says mages support wholesale murder. By voting when they did, my colleagues all but declared war upon the ordinary people of Thetis, a war in which we are outnumbered a hundred to one. I think this conversation is extremely important in understanding Mm -hmm. her character because she's not against mage freedom in and of itself. She Mm -hmm. thinks circles should exist, absolutely. But she understands the argument for freedom. She believes, though, that the breaking away of, uh, or the timing Mm -hmm. of breaking away is what was wrong. Um, Obviously, Mm -hmm. she would hate Anders if they ever met. (laughs) Just, I don't even want to imagine what would happen if they met each other. (laughs) But... And we will talk, I should say this too, um, we will talk about Anders soon on this podcast, but I don't want us to get into the weeds of the Anders Mm -hmm. conversation. And if you're watching Mm -hmm. that and you're listening to the podcast, it's coming. Just be patient. (laughs) So what do y'all think about this conversation? What do y'all think about her attitude towards mages, towards the rebel mages? Ooh, let's see. I'm not I'm not trying to get on a pedestal or a box or none. I, I don't want to like preach for two hours, but there is there is a narrative that has been pushed about like nonviolent protesting versus like, you know, more actiony violent protesting when it comes to injustices that are done. Right. I am not condoning violence. I'm not like sitting here being like, yeah, let's go beat up some people. That's not what I'm saying. But <laughs> there has there has been this discredit, like trying to discredit people who are like nonviolent protesting doesn't always work. Um, mm-hmm. 
sometimes you need something extra. And every time the conversation comes about fighting uh, fighting for rights and whatnot, people are like, oh my God, why are you getting violent? Why do you destroy property? Why do you blah, 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 blah? And so it reads a little funny to me to have Vivian, you know, be like, oh yes, protest, but, but don't support wholesale murder. Don't be violent. Don't be, you know, and it's like, are you giving me a little MLK versus Malcolm X? Is that what you're doing right now? Because, um, and uh, you know, it just it it sits funny with me that you like have your your first black woman character in here, and she's immediately like, oh my god, I absolutely hate the the violence that my fellow mages have engaged in. Um, and you know, it's okay to be opposed to violence, but like you know it just comes to like you need to do like non-violent protests or you need to like sit down or something kind of thing versus more action Mm -hmm. um and another thing that gets me is like she wasn't that I don't don't think she someone correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think she was there when they voted because the voting is in the Asunder novel when like Fiona was there and a bunch of the mages were there and they like were voting on whether to leave or not because it came to light that the right of tranquility could be reversed and it, it was always could be reversed. They were just keeping that information from mm-hmm. the mages. And so when they voted, it what it literally was not, you know, they weren't even thinking about, oh, Anders did what he did. Let's follow his lead. They were like, no, we got privy to some information that was messed up and we've had enough of it, you know? So it's like... I see what you're saying. There's like a lot of other pieces to consider and (laughs) they kind of give her this space of, again, she's the first irrefutably Black woman in the game that nobody can argue with me about whether she's Black or not. And (laughs) they decide to give her these really polarizing opinions Mm -hmm. where she is talking down to people who want to do violent protest. And then it's juxtaposed in an interesting way because it's then her against in her the way she's describing it against somebody like Anders who is like a white man and within the context of Dragon Age that's not supposed to mean anything Mm -hmm. but you're consuming it and it just makes it it made it very easy for people to dislike her when really what she's saying makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. and I can understand for her why it makes a lot of sense because we only have seen two circles in the entire game. And yes. she brings this up in dialogue. There are lots of circles mm-hmm. in Thetis. And, you know, we, the player, have only seen the two shittiest ones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's going to shape your opinion of her opinion. But, mm-hmm. I mean, this happened a lot in Inquisition. There was a lot of telling and not showing. So you're supposed to just take her word for it. There's a lot of things that were in this game that they just tell us you know, fill in the gaps, this happened, and then just just take it, but we're playing from our played experience, right? Mm-hmm. So I think if we could think of that consuming her character, it's interesting that that didn't, no one thought of that when writing her, having mm-hmm. this opinion, having the stance. You're thinking, okay, she is making a lot of sense. How are we going to help them to understand her? At this point, this is, I don't remember if this, this is not party banter. This is, you have to go and talk to her. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty well into the questions that you can ask her, which means that for some people, they may have already written her off and not want to explore this dialogue with her further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they will never hear this. And again, I think what she explains, the reasons that she gives for being distressful of rebel mages specifically Mm -hmm. is completely sensical. But there are not enough people that look like her having differing opinions. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being that she has to take the brunt of all of this like, ah, Vivian just hates mages and hates magic. She's like a yes. self-hating bitch. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> it, it kind of turned her into this lightning rod for that kind of criticism. Yes, it did. And it's not really fair that no one else, you're telling me no one else that you can talk to in Inquisition has a, an opinion similar to hers mm-hmm. who is also a mage. Because like yeah. Cassandra being a trained Templar agreeing with it reads it different. It don't hit right. It, it's, it hits a little, you know. Well, this is the funniest thing about this is Mm -hmm. that so in Dragon Age Awakening, because I have played a little bit of that Mm -hmm. DLC, Shelby, Mm -hmm. there's a conversation that happens when you meet Wynne in Awakening Mm -hmm. as the hero of Ferelden. And she's talking about the tension that's rising in the circles Mm -hmm. and Anders 
Anders, big old boy, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna join with the spirit and become an abomination. Anders says <laughs> to break away, that would cause all out war in Thetis. That would be good uh, yeah. for no one. Right. You just really, you have to, you have to recheck your homework before you turn it in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But again, things that we catch when we're consuming it, it's always funny to me that the people that are inside up and through it Mm -hmm. don't catch those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, you will talk about Anders later. I think that might maybe be an example speaking to his corruption, but it also could just be like that inconsistent writing. And Mm -hmm. then why then does it now have to be on Vivienne's shoulders to answer for that? Yeah. That inconsistency in his writing. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. yeah. And I think... I think part of the problem is that there are so many things that impact. Like part of it is, okay, she's the first unambiguously black companion Mm -hmm. that we've had. Mm -hmm. Another part of it is inconsistent writing. Another part of it is, okay, the fandom can be kind of rabid sometimes. Like, so there's Uh all of these different things that impact it. And unfortunately, like it all gets placed on Vivian's Mm -hmm. shoulders and that's really Mm -hmm. unfair to her, um, to the character. Definitely. So it is frustrating. I was just going to say, especially when they've given her such a clear spoken reasoning for her yes. opinions yes. and her reasoning. Yes. yes. Like you said, she's not some like random bitch on the street who's just saying stuff to say stuff. Mm-hmm. She's speaking from experience, education and intelligence and frankly, somewhat common sense. So some of the other things that she says or believes about mages, I don't want to just leave it at that Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of other stuff she says, Mm -hmm. but she does vehemently support the circles, Mm -hmm. um, but she never claims that the circles are perfect and fine as they are. Even she is not full sail agreeing with how the circles exist right now. She ultimately believes that the circles and the Templar order need to be restored to make sure that both mages and the ordinary populace of Thetis is protected. And I get where she's coming from. I have long said on this podcast that I think circles should exist, but they should just be like magical boarding Mm -hmm. schools. And we don't really need Templars. We could just have like one seeker at a circle. Like that's my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Vivian, Vivian probably would disagree with me a little bit, but like, she's not a person who's saying, okay, the circles are fine as they are. That's not at all her stance. And again, I think that sometimes in the fandom, we assume or that, that kind of opinion is put on her, but that's not what she believes. So interestingly, she also does support Cassandra over Liliana as divine. I think that's pretty obvious, but (laughs) she does think that she herself would be the best choice, um, which is interesting. And if you are interested in this conversation, I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole, but we had a patron chat with all of our patrons um, about who is the best divine. So if you want more info, want to think about that, whatever, listen to our opinions, you can go check out that episode. And then while she does support the circles, she absolutely does not, of course, support the Templars. I think that's also important to name. But really, there are a few things that Vivian prioritizes above all other things. First and foremost, she values the grand game of Orle. I think she's always playing it, and that's pretty obvious. She um, is is pretty focused on appearances. She's focused on what words you use and what you say both with words and with your body language. That's the first thing that she finds extremely important. The second thing is fashion and taking care of yourself. She's obviously the best dressed of Thetis, but she's also the person that treats the Inquisitor to a day of rest during Trespasser. She's not this ice queen that doesn't have a heart. She does care about you. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's important to raise up as well. And then third, like we've discussed, she hates violence and does mention it multiple times if you discuss the mages with her. And so those are three things about her character that I think really should be highlighted above all other things like her or dislike her I don't personally care what you think but you have to realize that she is not this like evil totally bad companion that just fully hates mages. Vivian does take a lot of flack for hating mages but there is Mm -hmm. only one choice regarding mages that you can make that Vivian outright like does disapproval for. Oh like a pro mage stance which mm-hmm. is accepting the mages as free members into the inquisition mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's the only one yeah. that she 
disapproves of. If you use the right of tranquility, she disapproves. If you Mm -hmm. do any other kind of thing against mages, she disapproves. There Mm -hmm. is an inquisition agent in the crossroads in the hinterlands where you can go up her and she's just like, why should I join the inquisition? Like they're supporting the rebel mages. Like they're Mm -hmm. just, are they any different? I remember that. And Vivian is the one who gets the special um, conversation to say, they're not like this. Like, do you think I would be here if that? Also, I can't remember, we talked about Vivian and the vote to break away from the Chantry. I believe she is there and I believe she's the only one who votes no. All right, Austin, I'm turning it over to you for the mid-break. After you work out, you can feel worn out. But don't stop now. Reach for Core Power to recover right. A delicious protein shake packed with 26 grams of high-quality protein to build muscle. It's the nutrition your body needs to repair, rebuild, and rise to a whole new level of recovery. Also, you can power on to that next workout. Champion your recovery with Core Power. Learn more at corepower.com. Enchantment? Enchantment! You need me. Ugh. I am yours as always. All right. Well, welcome to the middle of the show where we talk about all things that have to do with the podcast that do not have to do with the lore of Dragon Age. And so it is now that I thank our patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons. And I read our first patrons which are uh, Lisa M, Derek B, Genesis, and Zuba. Also, a special mention to Lewis H, who is our Nug King patron, who is read out every episode of the show. If you would like to join us on Patreon, you can do that. You can go to the Patreon link found in the episode description and sign up at various tiers, um, from just getting ad-free episodes to coming on the show with us once a month, which we had our patron chat last week, and it was a lot of fun. So I hear um, I was not there, but that's what I hear. Also, you can come hang out with us on Discord, the Cups Podcasting and More Discord server, where you can hang out and talk about all of our podcast, the this podcast, the Assassin's Creed lore cast, the Holocron History podcast, which I co-host with my Other co-hosts, Ben of Tamaria, and our new podcast, The Inheritance Cycle, page by page, where we read through and discuss The Inheritance Cycle or Aragon books and share impressions, theories, and first impressions because Shelby's reading them for the first time. So you can check all of those out. All those podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, various podcast catchers is the term I was looking for. Other than that, you can join us in the Robots Radio Discord as well, which is a Discord that's dedicated basically to video game podcasting. You can find that in the episode description. Um, If there is a video game or some kind of nerd thing, odds are the Robots Radio Network has a podcast for you. And if there's not, you can make one by joining the Rocket Club like we do. And so with that, we're going to transfer over to... um, Another way to support us is to leave us a rating or review on Spotify. And we do have, or on Apple as well, and we do have an Apple review to read today. So Shelby's going to read that for us. We do have a review. And this one is from Lewis H., who is our Nug King patron. Thank you again, Lewis. And Lewis says, a date night conversation starter, five stars. I recently went on a date, and as the night was drawing to a close, I was dropping him off at home. He noticed the Dragon Age lore cast in my recent activity on my phone. This extended the date for another hour while we discussed everything from the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels. We even made sure to remind each other swooping is bad, though not all the time because this podcast swooped into my life right when I needed it most. I absolutely love the Dragon Age franchise. It just has a way of drawing you in. Shelby and Austin reflect that in the episodes of the podcast. They make the content easily digestible and are always sure to scatter in a few laughs, fan theories, and an abundance of fun facts. 
playing through the games and reading the codex entries only gets you so far. Listening to this podcast has given me so much more insight into the amazing lore of Dragon Age and the immersive world the game creates. Both Shelby and Austin are extremely knowledgeable on the topics they discuss, and I especially like to hear their opinions and interpretation on different topics. I highly recommend this podcast for anyone looking to learn more about the Dragon Age universe. Thank you so much, Lewis H. Yeah, thank you so much. And as Dragon Age players, as Bioware gamers, we are always 100% in support of these games leading to romance. So great. That's great. Thank you so much. You too can support us by reviewing us on Apple or Spotify. If you leave words, we will, and a five-star review, we will read them out on a future episode of the show. Also, we have to share with you another Hero, Hawk, or Herald, which has been submitted to us. You too can submit one via Discord, Twitter, email, all our various means of communication. But Shelby's going to share a Hero, I believe. This is a Herald. Um, So this is from Starter Ace. They are in our Discord server. And this is their Herald. So their Inquisitor. Jesper is an empathetic and compassionate Dalish elven mage. Born the son of the clan leader, he was quite rebellious in his youth, but was shaken by the death of his younger brother not long before the events of the Conclave. When thrown into the events of the Inquisition, Jesper was horrified and scared. He did not want anything to do with the mark, and being thrust into a position of authority was was shocking for him. But once he saw the desperation of the people in Haven, he felt a duty to help. Jesper romances Dorian, and they have a passionate yet complex relationship. They bicker, both of their stubborn personalities clashing at some points, yet they both would give the world for each other in a heartbeat. When they first meet in Redcliffe, Varric practically had to drag Jesper's jaw off the floor, and they spent many nights flirting by the fire in Haven. Jesper recruited and was close to all the party members, caring for all people in the Inquisition. His best friends, however, were Cassandra, Solus, and Sarah, interesting uh, group, who kept his youthful rebellion alive. He and Vivian had the hardest time getting along, however, due to general differences in politics and culture. He sided with the mages, being a mage himself, and only was really close with Solus. At this point, he understood the threat better and felt it more pressing. He managed to get a compromise between Celine, Gaspard, and Briala, but because he is getting Good at getting himself into trouble, Jesper was enthralled by the exotic politics of the Winter Palace. Thank you so much for sharing your Herald of Andraste with us. So let's get back into Vivian and... Well, that was... uh, Orlesian. Dareth Shira. You fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is... Okay, so um, let's talk about a few quotes, and normally I will just read them all, and um, if there is one that sticks out to you, we can discuss it, or you could just share your thoughts about all of them, whatever, I don't care. So, uh, first, Vivian says, Kirkwall gave the world a reason to remember its fear of magic. A mage killed hundreds with a snap of their fingers. Across Thetis, a new tangible fear of magic grew. Commoners and nobles alike called out to the Chantry for protection. But the malcontents in the tower thought nothing of this. And then the second quote is, magic is dangerous just as fire is dangerous. Anyone who forgets this truth gets burned. And then thirdly, she says, we need an institution to protect and nurture magic. Maker knows magic will find neither on its own. End quote. What do y'all think? The proof is in the pudding. Like she's mm. <laughs> she's telling you all very good reasons mm-hmm. that are really hardly opinions about mm-hmm. magic. Mm-hmm. And just and to be clear, I always side with the mages. And this still makes sense to me. Yeah. And she was so close to the things that were going on. She knows Mm -hmm. these people that Mm -hmm. were like, and there's another quote I think that she has that kind of speaks to this as well, where she says, I saw rebel mages killing circle mages who were not rebelling with them. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. heavy. That's traumatizing. And she's right. And Mm -hmm. all of this, these three quotes that are here fully, fully encompass why what she says is not just bullshit you know yeah. i i i agree with that like she has some really good words of 
you know, wisdom, like the magic is dangerous, just as fire is dangerous. Anyone who forgets this truth gets burned. That is fantastic because uh, you do need to know how to control your magic. And, you know, I agree with that. Uh, I, I agree on her with that. I think that, you know, you have to remember that the power you hold can have um, catastrophic um, consequences, but also like with fire, it can bring a lot of good. It can, it can supplement your life. It can help you survive. It has a lot of good. It has, it has both ends of the coin per se. So I, I just, I just think she has a lot of wisdom. And then that's why it hurts a little when she like thinks that like the only way to some, in some cases, she thinks the only way to do something is like, you know, like she thinks we need Templars. And it's like, you know, even when you have like a Dalish Inquisitor, that's like the Dalish don't have Templars. It's okay. You know, it, it may be a side, you know. Um, so it's like, it's, she has good points. And I, I like her overall as character <laughs> genuinely. Um, and I think that's a, a lot of nuance that gets lost in, you know, in fandom spaces and even the, um, the material itself, even the text mm-hmm. itself, yeah. text itself. It's really funny yeah. that it comes across as being like this kind of gray area thing when she does speak it so clearly, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like she very <laughs> specifically says that she wants to protect and nurture magic. Yes. She never at any point says, oh, we're ugly, hideous monsters that need yes, to be kept exactly. away from the world. She yeah. says, we're dangerous. You need to be careful. All yeah. I'm asking is for you to be careful. And I think that there are certain lines of hers that, you know, from the writer's room and in the context of whatever is happening, get written up. Feels everything was written in a way that even though she's saying these exact words, somebody really wanted me to feel like she was trying to be like the Templars should leash us up and do whatever. Like the delivery felt like somebody wanted me to think that about her. Yes. But her lines from herself give more of that like Mm -hmm. no i want to nurture magic i want to protect magic we need to be careful and Mm -hmm. mindful of the things Mm -hmm. that we can do Mm -hmm. and i do think that it is ironic again in the context of the game it's not supposed to mean anything but you have vivian a black woman who is aware of how she might be perceived by other people Mm -hmm. and constantly check and is on top of it and then you have Anders, a white man who didn't give a fuck about any of that. He really didn't. Was only kind of considering (laughs) things in the scope of how it affected him directly. Mm -hmm. And like, didn't think about the privilege that he had with his magic. Again, I know the mages were oppressed. So not that type of privilege, but Mm -hmm. the the power that he had, the power imbalance that he holds other other people because mages having a bad day, he could just go and explode somebody, apparently. That's true. That's true. And it is very ironic because that's what we see in real life. Mm-hmm. Like this white man, again, is just kind of like exploding and booming all over the place, not thinking about how it's affecting others, mm-hmm. only himself. And then mm-hmm. here she is with kind of the same ability, but she is being very yes. calculated, careful, and constantly aware of how she's perceived and how it's affecting others. So I just thought that was ironic. Again, mm-hmm. in Dragon Age, that's not supposed to mean anything, that juxtaposition yeah. between them. But we live here and we're the ones playing it. <laughs> Ooh, right, exactly. Barley. I was just going to say, it's like Vivian to me in mm-hmm. these quotes and in the game, all of it is a perfect example of someone who can understand a complexity of a situation without mm-hmm. being this lukewarm middle of the road. Mm-hmm. There are good people on yes. both sides kind yeah. of attitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just really appreciate that because I feel like she's the first mage that we really encounter with who really does understand the complexity of the situation. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. before them. A little bit with Wynn, but even she towards the end of Sunders is just like burn it all down and so I just really appreciate that and I think that it comes to a point of Vivian it's really quickly on surface level to write her off that she's only concerned with her own power Mm -hmm. and maintaining the status that she is but time and again she brings it back to the everyday people Mm -hmm. of Thetis yeah it's so funny to me that her and Sarah hate each other because I feel like they're trying very differently trying to accomplish the same goal 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what I was going to say that the last quote I read, the last sentence is maker knows magic will find neither um, protection or nurturing on its own. And that's so true that it has to be protected, both the people who are mages and also the everyday people. And it, it's to me, I think the thing that is most frustrating about Vivian is that so much of the dialogue that demonstrates her stance is hidden after questions and questions and questions, and you have to basically dig for it. Like, you can't just mm-hmm. go to Vivian and get this. Like, she's not going to offer yeah. you this Im- information. And that is mm-hmm. so frustrating because there are so many people in the fandom that just instantly have written her off and that's exactly. frustrating and like some of that is on the person that's playing right like you got to take that initiative we can't all blame bioware like for all of it um but at the same time like we also have to be intentional about how we design dialogue like oh, it's yeah. a both mm-hmm. and situation yeah. i don't think it's either or uh but that's mm-hmm. the most yeah. frustrating part to me right and i think that we as a bioware fan as dragon age phantom specifically need to almost like check ourselves when we interact with these games of like not everyone who is anti-mage is the big bad evil guy like look at Fenris like Mm -hmm. from a straight up like Mm -hmm. he is arguably probably the most hostile person to mages we meet as a companion but Mm -hmm. you can get down and it's like I don't fault Fenris for hating mages if I was Fenris I'd hate mages too Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because it comes from a place of experience again mm-hmm. yeah like what yeah. vivienne is the same sharing the same thing and i think that that's why it's very interesting that like with someone like fenris with his opinions on mages and i think dragon age 2 best game is like <laughs> it does Finally. introduce a lot of nuance into that <laughs> i mean they're left and right giving you reasons to fear mages and giving you reasons to stand up for mages I say all the time that Dragon Age 2 feels like a really like elaborate DLC leading up to Inquisition. Like when you think about, and I appreciate this dialogue from Hawk that happens in the Fade. Hawk experienced a lot of traumas from magic Mm -hmm. because Miss Mm -hmm. Elandra, Hawk, bad bitch, love her. That was insanely bizarre. Yeah. What happened to her and something like that would make you feel apprehensive about magic. And I think that there are lots of other characters who have expressed a fear of magic. And Vivienne is one of the first ones to give you like point A, point B, point C about why you should be fearing those things. Mm. And Dragon Age 2 just gives you a lot of physical examples. So Mm -hmm. it is very interesting, again, that it all ends up being on her. So that's how you start to infer that there's something else going on here when you're directing this energy. Because mm-hmm. I'll say nobody really like I haven't seen anybody hate Fenris like in that <laughs> proportion to the way people dislike Vivienne. Yeah. And some people aren't even comfortable saying they don't like her. They're like, oh, well, I don't know. I just she doesn't click with me. Mm-hmm. But it's like some of those. And I know there are probably people who are like not fans of Fenris, but you will see. Mm-hmm. I think the proportion of that is not as visible. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. a lot of people really love Fenris. Mm-hmm. And he is another character who's still even being vehemently against mages he allows the nuance because him and bethany are very tight and they have Mm -hmm. a very positive relationship and Mm -hmm. everything that he dislikes about mages comes from a place of being um i was a slave to a magister who used magic to abuse me and it makes a lot of fucking sense you need to understand why he's uncomfortable with it but there's a point in um when fenris's banter with anders Mm -hmm. where he basically says our experiences are not the same yes like Mm -hmm. your oppression is not the same as my oppression it's not equal to my oppression and i think that vivian is another person who i feel like would understand that she would look at Mm -hmm. fenris and say yeah you have suffered in ways that i have not suffered Mm -hmm. no i would love for them to meet honestly i think fenris would hate her you'd have to keep him from (laughs) killing her for the first like 10 minutes you'd have to put him in the two-way glass so he can hear her opinion (laughs) and then he can enter the space 
So um, this is usually the point where we end our conversation, where we end the podcast, but not today. Um, today, we are um, going to turn it over to B and Vega and let them talk about, or at least let them lead the conversation about anti-Blackness and racism in the development of and the response to Vivian. So I'm going to turn it over to y'all. We will definitely still interject um, and all of that yes, stuff yes, too, please. but you guys are much more... Um, qualified to talk on this than we are. So, <laughs> yes, I am a professional black person. <laughs> and, you know, obviously, as you can tell, listening to this, it comes up when we talk about any aspect of the thing because we're yeah. sitting here playing it. And especially with Vivian, especially with mm-hmm. like characters who are black women, there's you have to really consider where some of this direction, misdirection is coming from. So, yes. I'm going to start with uh, discussing concept of her that were found. Uh, We talked a little bit about the designs that inspired her. um, And I'm just going to provide a couple of critiques that are in that that are somewhat common in games, but we're going to just look Mm -hmm. and see what they are. If anybody has played Inquisition, you know, the (laughs) hair options are not very bountiful. And it is very common for someone with really curly hair or really textured hair or locks or braids or anything that isn't just kind of like a ponytail or a bun to find a hairstyle that is even remotely close to what is found. I am curious. I want to know from other Black Dragon Age play- players how many of y'all have that part with the one braid on the side <laughs> so that you can pretend to have a braid. But Vivienne is bald and that is very common to find for Black characters in games to be bald or have a fade and that's a in the character creator as well but for Vivienne um I think most of not most excuse me all of the NPCs generally have a unique hairstyle that you cannot replicate Mm -hmm. um so it would have been a really good opportunity to give a hairstyle that you would not have to worry about I guess rigging on an ever-changing character because Mm -hmm. her it's it's just her it would stay the same and I'm certain some of this probably came from wanting her to wear her Maleficent cowl um Again, some things that people may not be intentional, but you have to think about what you're doing. So she is bald. As far as I can tell in concept art, she has always been bald. There was never any attempt to give her a full hairstyle. And again, Black women are beautiful when they're bald. And at the same time, it is very done a lot. And a lot of the reason is because you don't want to have to worry about what the hair is doing. The other thing to consider about Vivienne that's really important is that her voice actress is not Black. Indira mm-hmm. Varna, you might know her from Game of Thrones. She's Indian from the UK. I could not find the confirm if she's like mixed or anything like that with being how white she is. I just know that she is from the UK, but she is an Indian actress and she's not black. And I mean, I love her voice, yes. but it starts there in terms of representation. This is an opportunity for a black woman to get a check. And since Ashley Williams <laughs> is stuck in Mass Effect, Stop. we didn't get to have her for this one to be here. Um, so there's a lot of unnecessary anti-Blackness in the game as well. Yeah. Kind of stepping back from concept and just looking at the surroundings, and I kind of brought this up already, there's no context for the anti-Blackness that's in the game because there wasn't a transatlantic slave trade in Thetis, as far as I know. There's no reason to have racial-based prejudice, especially against somebody like Vivienne. And so the, the closest thing you get to kind of paralleling that is there's always a thing about people who are from the free marches. You could say that it's people treat her that way in game just because it's the free marches and everyone's like, oh, that's like the fake fancy place. You're from the free marches. <laughs> that's not Val Royale. And like... Colon party banter reveals that people at court talk specifically about her appearance, though. They're not talking about her being from the free marches. One of the particular dialogues I want to share is that Cole is, you know, doing his thing, giving what other people are saying, what other people are thinking. And Vivian has heard whispers of people at court being like, Grand Duke Bastien must have to turn off the lights when he's with his mistress, implying that she's ugly. False. But then another person follows up with that and says, but he would lose her in the dark. Ah. What? (laughs) <laughs> where does that animosity come from you know they're not talking about her being from the free marches they're not talking about her being a mage they're talking about the way she looks and it was very interesting to include that sort of oppressive comment in her backstory nothing about where she came from or how she's mm-hmm. kind of like climbing her way to the top but somebody's going to talk about her appearance i i interpret those comments as a writer or whomever did this whoever wrote this 
putting their own prejudice into the game. I, mm. I don't feel like it fits with the lore at all mm -hmm. um, because, and we can talk about representation in Dragon Age all day long. And while there've definitely yeah. been some good things, there've also been some major growth areas. I'll just put it yes. that way. Mm -hmm. But there's never to my knowledge been a, anything in the lore to say, okay, this group hates this group because of the color of their skin. It mm -hmm. has been, okay, we hate elves or we don't like mm -hmm. dwarves. Like that's mm -hmm. the racism in Dragon Age, not based on skin tone. So mm -hmm. to put that in there in the lore and in this conversation very much reads to me as someone putting their own racism into the games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. something else that it, could be they could be inserting your own racism and it could be again shorthand we understand mm -hmm. racism we understand racism to be an insult and somebody writing this is like you know how they will understand disrespect with racism it's shorthand to relate to how we understand things right mm -hmm. that too but you have the option whether or not to include that in your game i killed mm -hmm. a dragon why should i have to be worried about <laughs> colorism like right. right now it's from a literary perspective that mm -hmm you can still represent real world things that we all experience without mm -hmm. replicating them exactly. Yes. Like no one was ever questioning the parallels between the Dalish and yes. mm -hmm. all oppressed groups across status, or even the parallels of mage oppression versus, mm -hmm. you know, to LGBTQ oppression, or even, you know, racism in our real world, like hating mm -hmm. someone because of a way that they're born. Like, yes. we're not stupid that we can't get those parallels. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But it's like when you throw that in there, it it breaks the immersion of the game. And I'm no longer I'm no longer reflecting on that, on the actual real world problems in the universe. Mm -hmm. I'm now reflecting mm -hmm. on, OK, how did they do this? Well, now I have to reflect and OK, you brought this up and now I get to point out all the ways that you've been shitty about it. Ah, uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. I, I like that you said break the illusion because that's exactly what happened. I yeah. when I first was playing this game I fell victim to the the way that they presented Vivienne and I didn't take her with me very much yeah, and yeah. um the next time I was playing it I had her with me and I had a call and I heard that dialogue and it literally like took me out of it I was like what just happened <laughs> are they talking about Vivi the black woman you can't <laughs> see her when you turn off the lights all that gloss and there's no reflection all that gloss! I mean it was just so out of pocket and it's again, it has to do with writing because this happens in the books too. There are several yes. instances in The Calling where Duncan reflects on how he wishes his skin had been lighter. Fiona talks about how she had wished that her skin was lighter. Briala talks about how she, yeah. wished she didn't like her hair. You didn't like your skin. Like that stuff is in there. It's like, you know, it's and like, wait a minute, what? I know they're NPCs and not companions, so we get less, but we're mm -hmm. not told that Sir Barris or Mother Giselle faces any kind of obstacle like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's only Vivian. Yes. Yep. The things with those three examples that um I just mentioned, none of those things had to do with being like from Ravain for Duncan. Mm -hmm. Or about like being an elf for Briala and yes. Fiona. Like it wasn't like I wish I was a human, which w could work in the in context the of the lore that they have set yes. up. All of a sudden now Duncan wishes he was as light as the other boys. How mm -hmm. does that enhance my game experience? So I know that was a bit of a tangent on that, <laughs> bringing in other examples, but it kind of speaks to how it really all kind of came to the forefront with Vivian because of those people, Vivian has been the most main character. Yes. Something else that I wanted to share is that you get the sense that she has to work for what she has and that her demeanor and attitude towards Templars is a result of something internalized, right? Like that's the vibe mm -hmm. they're trying to give you. And we talked earlier yeah. about how she's not just like a self-hating bitch for no reason, but it's kind of coding it to be like an internalized thing and for you know playing the game as a black person that's how you read some of those cues to be like oh I'm not like those mages I ah! go to court I do this the court enchanter place wasn't a real job until I made it a real job and mm -hmm. that's not precisely what she is doing but the coding of that is easy to pick up mm -hmm. like somebody could easily interpret it that way yes and yes. there were no safeguards put in place to prevent somebody from taking it that way there's a voice line from cole that kind of gets at that whole she's always trying to stay on top of how she's being seen 
and how she's perceived and how people feel about her. Because after her harrowing, he gave a voice line that she said where she was like, I have to be okay. I have to show them that I'm still me to prove that she is okay after her harrowing. For Black women or Black people in general, tempering your composure is in some cases code switching for comfort. In some cases, it's survival. Something that like seeing her do that makes it relatable And at the same time, do I want to be relating to that right now? Yeah. I just killed a dragon. (laughs) And B, I I believe you had some other examples that you wanted to share. I do. I do. You know, Cole slips into her head like he always does. And he's like doing his blah, 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 because they're having an argument. And um, he's like, oh, my God, you like Templars. And she confirms it. She was like, wow, the demon can learn after all. And like, you know, he has this line where he's like, you don't need protection. And he says it in almost like this horrific tone. He's like, oh my God, you don't need protection from the Templars because you like them. To me, this this tells me two things. So like, she doesn't need the protection, right? One, she doesn't want the protection. And it's always, you know, if someone doesn't want something, then, you know, you don't necessarily keep pushing it onto them. Like Cole keeps trying to break through to her, but she really doesn't want that. And she doesn't want protection. And, you know, a thing that comes up in Asunder is like, you know, Cole was killing people because they were so terrified and, and that whole situation and the white spire and everything that was going on. And so she doesn't want that protection. So it's like, Cole, you can't give her that protection because she doesn't want it. Right. But then there's also the other side of it is she doesn't need protection because she's assimilated so well to the system of of oppression, the system that has been created for mages that she doesn't need protection because she has made herself so palatable Mm -hmm. to the people who hold this power. You know, you don't need protection from Templars because the Templars don't see you a threat because you have done every single thing on their checklist that tells them that you're not a threat. You know, it's like, there's no like, oh, I'm not a threat because I I said I'm not a threat. It's like, no, I showed them by their standards and their rules that I'm not a threat, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like, ah, not the assimilation. (laughs) I think it affects her perception of other mages who don't like, didn't go to the code as much as she did. Don't like, they just want to exist. They just want to be here. Not everybody wants to strive to that level of like setting, like going to a standards of a person who could literally kill you if they think you step like one pinky toe out of line. Um, Mm. And she like, you know, if you're not living up to that standard, you know, sometimes it feels a little bit like Vivian looks down on them a little bit it's because like I strive to 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 thrive within this system and only within the system why don't you thrive within the system you know and that's an example again of a trope for black characters to be like I'm gonna be the absolute best bitch everyone else needs to get on my level if you're on my level you'll survive it and it's very not looking out for the group as a whole it's Mm -hmm. divisive it's like I have to look out for me everyone should do what they need to do and that's a very common theme when you look at race allegories and stories (laughs) or when you look at black characters being written with tropes it's very like I'm a boss ass bitch who don't need nobody and she has to be so hard and stern when she gives lots of examples of her being otherwise, but I don't typically see that being the way that they describe mm-hmm. Vivian in fandom and in the game. They call her mm-hmm. the Iron Lady. Nobody's talking about how she takes you to get little cheese wheels on your eyes and tries to make <laughs> yeah. sure that you're taken care of. When she's calling you darling, it's not condescending. She yes. means it. She cares about you. So mm-hmm. those examples kind of show that trope being overplayed again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, it's interesting to me because everyone calls Wynn the mom friend. They do. Yes. But in reality, Vivian, I would argue, is probably equal, if not more than a mom character. I mean, yes. even when the conversation you have with her after Ghislaine dies, she's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, someone needs to tell his children and someone needs to mm-hmm. tell his sister there are yeah. all these things to do it's very much like a very realistic of like how a family member reacts after mm-hmm. a, a like pillar of the family dies and mm-hmm. but I've never in all of the Dragon Age media and fandom and places mm-hmm. I've, been, I've never seen Vivian referred to as a motherly that creature. is such no. a good point that is such a good guy. and then you I'm have afraid. to ask the question why that is because Again, like you said, I think arguably more than when, but 
a lot of people will very much lean into when being motherly when she's got, you know, some different stuff going on too. Why did fans react to it this way? Why were things written in a way that you would kind of be like breadcrumbed to this conclusion? Mm. So the other chunk that we wanted to discuss, uh, we did an episode on our podcast about whitewashing in Dragon Age. Um, there's So there's a lot more mm-hmm. detail of it there. So I'm going to kind of try to give a watered down version of it here. So in reference to fandom reaction to Vivienne, as soon as she was announced, people were questioning how yep. she would be for, I think the thought when she came out was they, we didn't know she was from the free marches. It was like, oh, this in Orlesian mage, cause she's in the Imperial court. So there were mods to make her have white skin, blue eyes. There were comments about how it didn't really make sense, how she could make to such high standing, mm-hmm. which again, that's a fandom response to what exactly what are you basing you're basing yeah, that on exactly. like, this world's standards but nothing in dragon age lore should necessarily make you think that a black woman can't be you know in her position and it's it's such a complex feeling for her because it is admirable that she is self-made she's worked hard for her station but realistically a black woman working hard to earn what she has is not a break from the status quo Mm -hmm. it would actually be more groundbreaking if she got to be a damsel in distress at some point and it seems like counterproductive to feminism but breaking from the damsel in distress trope is really the benefit of white feminism because white women were like doing the stay at home thing wanting to go out into the workforce but black women at that same time period were working and raising their kids so they've always been in the workforce they never had to fight for their right to go to work so it is not earth shattering yeah for a black woman to work hard right and and does that make her completely unrelatable of course not right we love to see an empowered black woman who we were talking about with Cole. I don't need your help, nor do I want your help. Mm-hmm. Right. But the problem comes when you only have the one character to refer to in a game. And that's when things become tropey. That's when you have like stereotypes, tropes, characterizations that aren't unique. And you have to consider what you're including. And if it was truly thoughtful, like when you were having your character lineup, did you think about who was being represented? Mm -hmm. And the only dark skinned woman we have was written to be controversial and very easily unlikable. Like I know, um, Shelby, you were saying we can't blame Bioware for everything. So I won't because he said so. But (laughs) thinking about like what was written, right? You have to dig for those gems of her personality. You can kind of tell what Dorian's about up front. And then all of the softer notes under him are like a treat for exploring, some of the things you need from Vivienne are almost necessary to understand her. That's not just a treat for exploring. You have to give incentive to explore, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what they give you is a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you to this particular opinion about her. It was very easy to find her controversial. It was very easy to find her unlikable. And like characters are allowed to be nuanced, right? But again, when you start considering fair representation, It's just something that you think about playing the game as a Black person. And I see lots of people every day, you know, defending someone like Blackwall's actions. Mm -hmm. He's a white man. People defend his actions all the time and talk about how characters can be complex. Characters can be flawed, et cetera, et cetera. But not the same liberties are not given to Vivian all the time. I will say I think that it's gotten better in recent Mm -hmm. years, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. we cannot ignore how long it lasted in fandom for people to be so blatantly against her. And now we're kind of at this place where people might, if they dislike her, they might say, yeah, we just don't really click. I don't know why, but we don't, we don't click. The evidence of what we were given is still very here. And it's interesting that you said that she acts like an older relative, Austin, because I had that in my notes that the way that she acts is like that. She's a kind friend to the Inquisitor. She shows genuine concern for you as if she was an older relative. And I want to... I think it's worth mentioning. We've already talked about like her demeanor compared to when I don't see this much divisiveness about Morgan. I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Morgan is a bitch. And that's like (laughs) her whole thing. She's your bitchy goth girlfriend and everyone loves her. I'm sure there are people who don't love Morgan, but on the whole, you don't see again, the proportion of that is not the same. She is arguably meaner than Vivienne because, you know, back in the day, she gives you disapproval for just helping people which is what Vivian likes to do. And she enjoys helping others. She's motivated by a sense of keeping others safe. And you just, you never saw P 
people saying the things about Morgan that you saw that they saw about Vivian. So then it's like, well, why are you saying it? I find that more people again enjoy her now than they did early game release. The game forums were just a mess with with slurs and we need to change her appearance. I'm never going to recruit her. Did not happen with Fenris. It did not happen with Morgan. At the same time, after playing a game where you could have potentially just saved mages from a Kirkwall circle, yeah. and we only have Vivian's word to go off of, they 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 know what they were doing. Like they know what they had to know what they were throwing you into with giving you like you just saw the circle explode and you just had to save all these mages from a red lyrium crazy lady. And <laughs> you're going to expect me to go into Inquisition, trusting wholeheartedly the character who's the only character who is a mage saying we need to keep circle but you just took me from a situation where the circle Mm -hmm. was you Mm -hmm. know really really fucked up Mm -hmm. and corrupted you knew what you were giving me again the the breadcrumbs leading you to a specific opinion you knew i would be skeptical of vivian having come out of dragon age 2 yeah i know shelby and i fell into the trap of Mm -hmm. dismissing vivian right from the Mm get-go as well yeah i definitely did i did too like you said coming out of that situation going to Vivian, it's very difficult to want to understand her after what you've just finished doing. It seems contradictory. So those were some of the things that I think about in terms of intentional and unintentional racism. It doesn't really matter if it's intentional or not, but a lot of these Mm -hmm. things are microaggressions. And then some of this early stuff was not a microaggression. It was just straight up, we don't want to see this Black woman prosper. I mean, with the mods and such. But unfortunately, a lot of it is microaggressive, and that's the most frustrating one to deal with. It's really frustrating to know that Vivian is so controversial. A lot of us play video games Mm -hmm. for escapism. Mm -hmm. We go Mm -hmm. to be immersed in a world that's not like our world, that we can escape to and experience and do all of that. And yeah, we might see some, we want some realism there. Once you put into such an overt, like, realism, racism into the game, like, Mm -hmm. for people of non-white colors, the game is no longer a safe place for them to escape to. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 Bioware be better about remembering that these games can create safe places for people and inserting such an on-the-nose allegory in a fantasy world that previously has not had any kind of indication that that type of prejudice even exists it's no longer safe very true and thank you so much for um kind of leading this discussion i think there's a lot of really really important things that we need to hear as a fandom um about vivian Mm -hmm. about all of it but especially about vivian so thank you for leading that Mm -hmm. section um Mm -hmm. we always end our character deep dive episodes by talking about why we love or why do we hate this character Mm. so Mm -hmm. um who wants to go first i do love vivian uh i bring she is now a standard party member for my playthroughs Mm. um, mainly because i tend to not play a mage uh, because i like the rogan warrior play style Mm -hmm. i bring her because from a tactical standpoint if you pair her with take black wall and then you take vivian too Mm -hmm. you're invincible that's true. Uh, I, I'm not kidding. Like, there, I have literally watched and fought a dragon and not even lost a thing of guard based on the abilities that Blackwall and Vivian and all them do. And so she's now become a staple party mm-hmm. member for me. Mm-hmm. And so I really love her. I love, um, I love the conversations that she can have if you choose to be a night enchanter, mm-hmm, where she's yes. like, good choice. Like, yeah. And I see, I can see a little bit of criticism from like a pro mage standpoint. And especially like, I can see like, if you're really like deeply role playing a Dalish Inquisitor, I can see Mm -hmm. where like that tension would kind of come into about in that like, none of the human characters are really that great towards elves, except for Mm -hmm. maybe Blackwall, Cullen and Cassandra. But even Mm -hmm. then, like, it's (laughs) it's <laughs> so yeah, exactly so like I can kind of see that reason for not liking her and I didn't like her when I first game because I wrote her off as oh well you know you hate mages and I hate Anders but I don't hate mages so Weak. 
So that was it. That's kind of where I'm at. Mm. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, I can go next. What I love about Vivian trying to step back from kind of the context of what we've been talking about, I think she's really funny. Mm. I enjoy the way that she talks about things. And I like that everything she says is, and that's the nature of her being from Orle. It's like she gives a lot of metaphors and it's like she hits the point every time, but it's really, sometimes it's really like dry humor. And I don't usually like dry humor, but I like it when it comes from her. So that kind of like mm-hmm. kind of sparked something in me. I really love the way that she talks to and interacts with the other characters. I like her conversations with Iron Bull and still that kind of like doting thing. She's like, when did you wash your sword? And he's like, oh, we were just fine. We're going to fight again. And she was like, mm? and he was like, oh, okay. Yes, I'll, I'll wash. And she's like, thank you, darling. I, I I love that. I would love for her to read me a story. Or like, tell me affirmations in the morning. She would be great for that. Um, And again, maybe something that I disliked about her on contact was I did not like her animosity towards Cole when I was Mm -hmm. first playing the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't, I hadn't taken them together long enough to hear him throw that line back at her uh, that we were referencing earlier where he gets really like kind of animus at her. But these days... The only things that I um, dislike about Vivian maybe is some of that like higher status, like, oh, that's dirty. Like Vivian wouldn't come with me on a mud run and she shouldn't have to, (laughs) but that's kind of like, if I felt like I had a character who wanted to just like go and like do something like crazy, she'd be like, "Mm, no, that's, but that's just like the bougie in her, which is fine because I mean, she's from the kind of glitz and glam and kind of understanding some of how she got to that place again it's really hard to dislike her now the way that you're kind of like trailed to do when you first have contact with her in the game but yes I very much like the way that she communicates to the others and how she shows everybody she cares a little bit even when she's condescending to Blackwall she's very polite to him about it because there's a really fun dialogue where he's like, I missed a blow and you had to take it. I'm sorry, Marilyn. And she's like, <laughs> you could never offend me, dear. <laughs> like, she's like, that's cute that you thought you could offend me. I just, I love it. Yeah, I, I really agree with you about the Cole situation. And that's what turned me off to her at first. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I really did not like the way that he, that she responds Um and calls him a demon and Cassandra does it too. And that I also had an issue with that. Um, so that's what turned me off at, at the beginning and not necessarily like her stance toward the mages. Like I didn't really care because I get both sides of that issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing that completely changed my mind at my first playthrough is in Trespasser when she takes you on the spa day. Like I'm mm-hmm, a sucker mm-hmm. for a spa day, first of all. <laughs> but like it really demonstrates how much she really does care about you. Like she's the Mm. only person that cares about your own well-being outside of your job. Like she's the only friend, at least like we can talk about romances, but like she's the only companion though that takes you to get rest. Like you're Mm -hmm. doing stuff with everyone else. And I think that deeply shows how much she cares about you. And so for that reason, I do like her. Um, And I, I, it's hard for me to personally answer the question of, do I love Vivian or do I hate Vivian um, or why? But that's because I feel like her character is so tied up with the Mm -hmm. fandom reaction. Um, And so I Mm -hmm. feel like it's hard to say, yes, I love her. No, I don't love her. And here's why. Um, And that is frustrating because, you know, it should always be just about the character. But unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. So, but ultimately, I mean, I do like Vivian. I don't hate her. Um, But Mm -hmm. I I see the, I definitely see the criticisms of some of the ways she's been written. So. Well, um, I think I, I'm similar um, to your, your stance, Shelby. I, I don't, love her I don't hate her but I appreciate her um and like it took how many playthroughs through I think it took like my third or fourth playthrough of Inquisition to like actually have her around a lot because I kept playing 
I kept playing mages. And so I was like, I'm playing a rogue this time. I'm doing it. Um, I got to I got to take, you know, let's mix it up. And I ended up seeing her whole quest line because usually I got to like Bastian dying and then I never got to see what happened after that. Um, but this one character I did and where she like was talking to other members of the family and blah, 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 blah. And there's like a wink, wink, nudge moment where you're like, wait a minute. You still turn this into like a a, 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 a win for you somehow. And, you know, I was like, oh, my God. And I think she's just so smart. I think she's so brilliant. Um, I think she's incredibly powerful. I, I, I think and, you know, I don't agree with all of her takes. Um, you know, and but she still has um, wise advice and wise things to say. She can still be mother and she can still take care of you, but she can be really, really petty. I appreciate petty, you know, <laughs> um, and she she butts heads with some of my favorite characters and then she butts heads with some characters I don't like. And um, I just appreciate her for the character that she is after playing for so long. And, you know, also like, you know, you go through years of life and you get different perspectives, you know, like my perspectives on some characters have just changed by like how I've changed. Um, and so, yeah, I just appreciate her. And I'm hoping my next playthrough, I get to take her along a little bit more. I will not be playing a mage. I'm specifically playing a rogue. Like, so here's hoping. <laughs> Actually thinking about the VM being petty, I have a potential fun fact if that's okay if I share one and it, it may I think that this one's like happens enough that people have heard it even if they never do it but if you happen to take an all mage party of uh, Vivian and Dory and just go to town roasting Solas and like you have the <laughs> you have the potential to hear half of it if you bring just Dorian he initiates it and says that Solus looks like an apostate hobo or something like that. Mm. But if you bring Vivian, she interjects and she's like, um, unwashed apostate hobo. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening? You're like, imagine you're walking and you turn around, and you're like, what's going on back there? That's hilarious. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both for being here. Uh, if you would want to just take a quick moment and plug your uh podcast where people can find you and talk to you, hang out, all that stuff. Sure. We have a Twitter. Uh, account uh it is just when in thetis pc for podcast on twitter uh that's our only social media platform that we have and when you go to the twitter page you can see the the links to get to our podcast it is on spotify um apple podcast and a variety of other podcast platforms uh we host through buzzsprout so if you go to our buzzsprout website as well which is also on our twitter page you can listen to it directly there and uh like for this podcast if you are listening on apple music feel free to leave us a review so we can get some feedback on how we're doing we're both new to podcasting so yeah. we were very flattered and excited that we were invited to hang out with austin and shelby today um and again if you're interested in hearing discussions kind of similar to this one, not necessarily this heavy about racism, but hearing about Dragon Age from the perspective of an intersectional playthrough from the perspective of Black LGBT gamers. Um, check us out. We talk about different things that are not lore related, but we talk about decisions and we bring up subjects like the whitewashing episode we did recently. We have an upcoming episode uh, that discusses how Morgan does a lot of elf explaining to the Inquisitor. <laughs> so if you're interested in just little things like that, check us out. Yeah, and thank you so much for for having us on. It was it was a fantastic time, and I think we both learned things that we just straight up were not aware of, even mm -hmm. as playing as long as we have. So thank you so much, really. Yeah, thank y'all for being on the show and thank you for your podcasts. I listen um, to y'all's episodes and they're great. So if oh, you're listening, you. absolutely go follow. They're awesome. <laughs> Definitely. And then at last, uh, we like to give our absolute special thank you to Lewis H., our Nug King patron, who gets thanked at the midbreak and the end of every episode of the show. So thank you for your support there and thank you all for listening to the dragon age lore cast we will see you next week thanks for listening to the dragon age lore cast as always you can find us on twitter at da lorecast 
If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at dalorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Ariel. And we're the hosts of the Legend of Zelda Lorecast, a podcast about all things Legend of Zelda, from Errol to Zora, and all the fun things in between. If you're ready to dive deep and learn more about the Legend of Zelda lore and everything surrounding it, come join us on the Legend of Zelda Lorecast. You can find us on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google, or wherever else you get your podcasts. We hope to see you soon.